If we were asked to describe ourselves in a few words, well, we might have a hard time knowing exactly what to say. Many people don't realize it, but God did this very thing about himself. It all started when Moses presented an unusual request to God. He asked him to show him his glory. God said this, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And God gave Moses a revelation of himself that no man, apart from Jesus, has ever had. The Bible tells us the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. In just a few words that would take about a half a minute to recite, God reveals his nature and his attributes to Moses. And because Moses wrote this down and placed it in the book of Exodus, the entire world can get a concise and perfect summary of the nature of God coming from the mouth of God himself. This is God's self-definition. We don't have to wonder or guess or speculate about the nature of God. We have it in his own words. God starts by proclaiming his name, the name by which the Jews knew him. Most Bibles translate the Lord as though it were a title, but God is not giving his title. He's announcing his name. When you see the word Lord spelled with all capital letters, the actual Hebrew word was Yahweh. God was not saying the Lord, the Lord God. He was saying Yahweh, Yahweh God. He was declaring his name and announcing that he is the ultimate ruler of all things, all peoples, and all nations. He is Yahweh. God goes on to describe his nature, the attributes that define him. The first two on the list are good news to all of humanity. He tells us he is merciful and gracious. To be merciful is to be kind to people who do not really deserve kindness. God's mercy and grace reach their ultimate expression with the sending of Jesus Christ into the world to die for our sins. Paul writes, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Thousands of years before Jesus arrived, God was tipping his hand to Moses that he had good intentions for his creation. God is surely Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious. And then God tells Moses and all the rest of us, that he is long-suffering. He puts up with a lot from his errant, dull, easily straying children. When we look at our dysfunctional world and all the crime and the sensuality and the rebellion and irreverence that is continually on display, it's a wonder God can stand us at all. And yet God is long-suffering, patiently bearing with our terrible attitudes and wicked behavior. God tells Moses he is abounding in goodness and truth. So far, God's self-description is very, very positive. Everything he is saying about himself is good news to all of us. Our creator is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and he abounds in goodness and truth. Who would not want a relationship with a God like this? We sing the song, God is good all the time, and it turns out from his own mouth that God is not merely good. He abounds with goodness, which means he has a whole bunch of goodness. His abundant goodness moves him to provide well for his children and even to bless those who are not his children. Jesus tells us God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust.
The major reason people do not come running to Jesus as soon as they hear about him is that they doubt the goodness and kindness of God. They're afraid Jesus would cramp their style. They couldn't enjoy all the pleasures they currently enjoy if they were to become real Christians. What are they doing? They're doubting the goodness of God. What they're saying, at least inwardly, is, I could have more fun and a better life and a happier life and a more fulfilling life away from God than I could ever have as a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is, of course, nonsense. The people who are most satisfied with their lives and most content with their circumstances are those who are fully committed, born again, praying, Bible reading, evangelical Christians. They typically have better marriages, less conflicts, more contentment, and a far deeper sense of purpose than their secular, non-believing neighbors. In the latter part of God's self-description, he finally speaks of his severity toward those who reject him or turn from his ways. After declaring all these very, very positive attributes, he says of himself, by no means clearing the guilty. At least, that's how my Bible reads. But if you look carefully, you find that the words, the guilty, are written in italics, which means they were added by translators and were not part of the writings of Moses. What God actually said was, by no means clearing, dot, dot, dot. Leaving it to Moses and the rest of us to figure out who it is that he by no means clears. Of course, if we want to know who God refuses to accept and determines to punish, well, we can just read the rest of the Bible. It is spelled out plainly. God does not clear wicked, unbelieving people who live for themselves and refuse to bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. After giving us a list of God's loving attributes, he feels it necessary to remind us that he has nobody to trifle with. We must not take God's goodness for granted and assume that because he's merciful and abounds with goodness, we can live as we like. We can freely break his commands. We can fornicate to our heart's content, and God will have no problem with us. And so God essentially declares, I by no means clear those who reject me, flaunt my laws, and refuse to submit to my Son, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul put it this way, Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. How do we continue in God's goodness? By putting our faith in Jesus and then living a life pleasing to God. And through the grace of Jesus, we will enjoy an eternity of the goodness of the Lord. As David wrote, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.